In this armed self-defense series, we've reached the end. We're going to talk about mindset. To me, that's the most single most important thing that's going to get you through a gunfight and come out the other side as a winner. So if you want to learn about how to develop your mindset for gunfighting, stick around. Hello folks, I'm Dick Fairburn. This is the fourth in my armed self-defense series uh, that talks about the, the firearms program I've developed after 40 years of experience in that field. And this talks about mindset. When we broke down our training program and, and finalized it, we, de we determined that there were three separate categories of things that officers needed to learn. Marksmanship, that's the easy one. That's what we do 90% plus of our time on the range is spent in marksmanship training. But mechanics were important. How do we keep the gun running in a gunfight? We know now that 20% of the time or more, police officers will experience malfunctions with their pistols, even pistols that are normally very reliable. And it happens because a gunfight is very exciting. You don't have a perfect grip, a perfect stance. You may not even be on your feet when you have to fire the pistol. So that causes malfunctions. We need to master those. The third of the three M's was mindset. And this is what will carry you through the fight. If your mind is right, you are mentally prepared to deliver deadly force against another human being. A terrible thing. But you dying is more terrible from my point of view. I want you to live through the gunfight, and we need to talk about how to get your mind right. And to start with, you know, why are you armed? Why are you carrying a pistol either at home or out in public? And there are a lot of reasons. Police officers in this country go armed. Military folks, more than ever, are carrying handguns, and we're seeing those handguns used more frequently in the war on terror than we ever did in, in conventional warfare of World War I, World War II. Security officers carry guns. And now, despite all the, the horrible things that have been happening in the United States the last year or so with attempted gun control, the courts have backed us. And with the Bruin, Nyserpa versus Bruin decision a few months ago from the Supreme Court, we're eventually going to see, I think, more opportunity to carry weapons out there to protect ourselves. They have struck down the May issue of the New York um, law, as well as California, Hawaii, other states that had those type of things. So now, in all 50 states, you can get a concealed carry permit. Some of the states are still putting high hurdles for you to get over. They're also closing a lot of areas in their state calling them sensitive zones where you can't carry a pistol. Again, I think the courts will eventually rectify the situation and we will see a lot more people be able to be armed to protect themselves, their families, their friends out in public. Okay, So in order to do that, you need to understand what is your role with a pistol and what do you need to know in terms of mindset. The law enforcement mindset has got to be different from an armed civilian. I had over 40 years in law enforcement, but now I'm retired. I'm just a concealed carry guy like most of you. That limits when I can use deadly force. Police officers have more latitude to use deadly force than citizens. So you need to focus your mindset on your legal standing that, that you have every day when you leave the house. Failing to have their mind right, I talked about this in, in the, the marksmanship issue. It's very easy to train people to hit a man-sized silhouette target at seven yards 100% of the time. But back in the days of revolvers, when cops had six rounds available to them, we would, we would consistently see some good shooters who fired 100% score on the shooting range fire a 0% score in a gunfight. 
it wasn't because they didn't have marksmanship skills. It's because they couldn't use those marksmanship skills under stress because they had not polished those marksmanship skills under stress and therefore programmed their mind to be part of that package. I've mentioned in earlier segments the importance we have learned in the last couple of decades about the difference between your forebrain and your midbrain, high ordered thinking part of your brain as opposed to the reptilian brain is, is what many psychologists call it. The midbrain has to be programmed for it to work and, and it is essentially just running a line of code from its programming. It won't deviate. That means we have to program it properly. And if we do that, it can multitask. It can take care of sight alignment or malfunction clearing or some other problem during the gunfight while our forebrain is thinking about target identification. Is this a legal situation where I, I'm justified in firing? We can multitask through those things. But you have to understand the difference between the forebrain and the midbrain and how they function. So it's important to train ourselves as much as possible under stress. So that's not just slow fire on the pistol range. That's not just living in an indoor range where I have to pick the pistol up off the bench, fire a small group and a paper target, put it back down. You know, I have to include drawing, moving, uh, a lot of different aspects that, that have to come in here. There are ways to induce that stress. You can, in, you can induce stress on yourself with the use of a timer. Beep goes off. What's my first round draw? Am I getting my first round off within a second and a half or even more? What's the split between my rounds? How, how rapidly are they I firing them and still getting good center hits on the target? That induces a kind of a stress. Competitive stress is probably one of the easiest ways we have to train ourselves uh, to overcome stress. Competition in either IDPA or the uh, USPSA shoots can help you operate under stress. You're under time stress, you're under competitive stress, uh, you know, you got your peers out there watching you do it. If you make some kind of mistake, that induces a level of stress. Scenario stress is really the best way and, and the most uh, high-ordered polish that we put on police officers. And to do that, we use simunition rounds. Simunition rounds fire paint bullets rather than real bullets. They, they require either a special pistol, uh, uh, the Glocks that we had at the state police or many agencies use, they're called a 17T for training. They have a blue frame. They have a slide that will only fire those subcaliber some munition rounds. So we pad ourselves up. We put into a situation where I am engaging against a live adversary. Uh, there are simulators that, that put you against a video um, response. And that's a great way to in, in, induce stress as well. But ultimately, that simulator can only veer off into so many different tangents of the situation. Ultimately, you have to go mano a mano with another individual who's going to shoot you as soon as they can. So that means you have to be prepared to shoot them first. Those kind of situations are tough to get as civilians. I know the uh, uh, U.S. Concealed Carry Association has some training that, that has very well put together scenario-based training. There are training organizations like Gunsight, Thunder Ranch, where they can put you under a lot of stress into, into a live fire shoot house. And, and the more you train yourself under stress, the more that midbrain will be programmed to operate during this toxic, corrosive event that is combat with another human being. To me, one of the most important things you have to do with, with mindset is you have to have a kind of a, a layer of base programming. The basic right of self-defense. There are countries around the world, there are still states in the United States where the concept of self-defense is not necessarily automatic. A lot of states force you to retreat from a deadly threat before you are justified under their laws in using deadly force yourself. Other states have adopted, uh, the, when the NRA was pushing this heavily, they called it the Castle Doctrine. My house is my castle. I shouldn't have to retreat from an armed threat. I can stand there and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Okay, so you have to know the laws of your state. You have to know the rules of engagement that restrict what you can do legally. And you have to know those things intimately. You don't have time to go look them up. 
You don't have time to do a refresher. You have to know these things absolutely so that your brain, your midbrain, can operate those when needed. There's even a religious element here. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. I know people who have said that, I know cops, um, who eventually washed out of the training on their own choice because they made the decision that, you know, in, in this job I may have to, to kill someone and I can't do that. I can't take another human life. And that's okay. We had a, we had a young uh, state police cadet come through one time and she refused to even touch a gun. I was in charge of the firearms training unit at the time and she wanted to see the supervisor and I said, okay, tell me what's going on here. And she said, I could never kill another human being. There's just no way I could do it. And this is curious to me because I wonder how she got this far in the process to be, you know, tested and then hired without someone asking her that question. And I said, what did you do before you came here to become a trooper? Well, she worked for the Department of Children and Family Services. She was a child protective investigator. And, and, and she said, but I could never take another human life. And I said, well, that doesn't make you a bad person, you know. Um, I said, you know, there's a couple people I would kill tomorrow if I thought I wouldn't go to prison for it, but then that, <laughs> I'm not necessarily the best person. I said, if you can't take another human life, that's okay, but you can't be a cop in the United States. You have to carry a gun. You have to be able to defend yourself and I said, and you have to take that step further. You have an obligation to protect innocent people from harm. You may have to kill someone who's not even a threat to you at the moment, but they're a threat to someone you're sworn to protect. I said, if you can't do that, then you know maybe you need to go back to DCFS, or maybe you should be a paramedic or a firefighter, or you know, all of those are noble professions, but I think you've picked the wrong line of work here, young lady. And a couple of days later, she realized that, and she agreed, and she left. Doesn't make her a bad person, but unfortunately, she probably took a spot from someone who would have done better, and we were shorthanded, so we needed the people. It's unfortunate. But she told me several times, well, you know, the, the Sixth Commandment says, thou shalt not kill. And um, I had a very dear friend who was an army chaplain and we stayed in touch long after both of us were out of the army until his death and we, we discussed that one time and he said well in the first place it in the King James Version where it says thou shalt not kill he said it's actually mistra mistranslated he said if you go back to the original language the word was rasach which meant murder so he said that commandment didn't, wasn't really given as thou shalt not kill it was thou shalt not commit murder, an unjustified killing. If you read other parts of the, of, you know, the, the Bible, the Quran, other, other documents, they, they talk a lot about killing in the name of God. Sometimes God sends people out to kill on his behalf, kill bad people that need to be killed. Uh, Clint Smith is the, uh, the honcho of Thunder Ranch. He was quoted on 60 Minutes 2 one time trying to explain to some info babe why, you know, police snipers were legitimate when they killed people in the line of duty. And he said, lady, you don't understand. Some people just need to be killed. If you didn't agree with that, I don't think you would be listening to this video. So the Sixth Amendment was mistranslated. I mentioned earlier that law enforcement officers have a different level of being able to use deadly force than civilians. Police can, under the right circumstances, use deadly force to stop a fleeing felon, to stop one, some, someone from escaping and further endangering society. Now, it's very narrowly restricted, and it's been more and more restricted by the courts as time went on. But if someone is truly a forcible felony, they are still armed and they are still a great threat to society, you can shoot someone in the back while they're running if you're a cop. Now, in today's litigious society and in, in the, the uh, anti-police uh, situation we have going on in this country right now, it's going to be tough. And I would say a lot of police officers are probably not going to choose to make those shots, even though they legally could. Citizens can't. You do not have the right to shoot someone who's fleeing from you. 
you do not have the, the right to shoot someone to prevent them from stealing your property. Deadly force has to be used in kind. You can use it against someone who is threatening you with death or great bodily harm, or threatening a member of your family, or just threatening someone else in your immediate area with death or great bodily harm. Earlier I mentioned a, a shooting at a mall in Indiana uh, last year where a young concealed carry holder engaged an active shooter who was actively killing people at the, uh, the food court in a mall. He pulled off some great shots. He hit this guy from over multiple times from over 40 yards with a handgun. Great shooting. He was not necessarily an immediate threat himself at that point, but other people were. You're justified at that point. But as I say, when they're fleeing from you, if you shoot, you're wrong. Other kind of programming you can put in your brain that's going to help your brain make those instant decisions because it's had the ability to think through them ahead of time. Um, there are books that you can read. Alexis Artwall is, is a researcher. She has a book called Deadly Force Encounters. And a lot of her study helped us understand what happens to police officers when they're in gunfights. Uh, a lot of them suffer tunnel vision. They, they lose their peripheral vision because everything focuses in. I've mentioned uh, with simunitions, getting shot in the hands a lot because the cadets are focusing in on that gun. That's, that's a kind of a, a tunnel vision thing. Another interesting thing is auditory exclusion. A lot of officers don't hear their shots like they would normally hear them on the range, even, even with hearing protection on. And in a gunfight, they typically don't have hearing protection. But they report that the shots sounded muffled. Uh, we've got a couple pieces of uh, body cam footage or, or uh, uh, dash camera footage of officers who are clearing their weapon in the middle of a gunfight. And when they were interviewed later, the, the, the pistol did not malfunction. So they asked them why they were doing the tap rack to, to keep you know, clearing that pistol. And they said, the shots didn't sound right. They sounded really weak, so I thought the pistol was malfunctioning. It's because their ears did not hear the boom that their brain thought it should be hearing during the gunfight. Dave Grossman, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, a retired Army Ranger, uh, he wrote the book called On Killing. He's done a num uh, amazing research in what it takes for one human to kill another human and then what they need to do afterwards to kind of survive that situation. His second book is called On Combat and that extends that even more. And in his research, he said he has interviewed people who, the, the auditory exclusion thing, he said, even though they had no hearing protection and they fired a number of rounds during a gunfight, their ears weren't ringing, which they should have been. He thinks that our brain has the ability to blink our hearing during some of these kind of situations. So there's a lot of physical things that you can program into yourself and, and hopefully then in a gunfight, your brain won't be going, there's something wrong because I can't hear the gun going off. But that midbrain can say, ignore that and keep going, because that can happen. You know, I've been programmed to understand that auditory exclusion can happen. Colonel Jeff Cooper, who founded Gunsight Ranch, uh, was a uh, World War II Marine Lieutenant Colonel. He founded the modern technique of the pistol. He took us, he started the process we have been in since the 1960s to master pistols and to learn how to really fight with them effectively. And in terms of mindset preparation, I think he invented one of the greatest tools that we can have. Um, I was fortunate enough to hear Colonel Cooper give his color code lecture at Gunsight in 1981. And I even bought a copy of the videotape of that and I played it in training classes until the tape got so worn out I could hardly use it anymore. What Cooper does is break down alertness and, and mental preparation for combat into four colors, white, yellow, orange, and red. White is completely relaxed. You are unaware of what's going on around you. It, it, when you're asleep, you are in condition white. Unfortunately, a lot of cops are out there working the streets in condition white when they shouldn't be. Um, a lot of concealed carry holders are in condition white when they shouldn't be because you need to be alert to what's going on around you. You need to understand that the world is a dangerous place. 
and you need to maintain 360 degree security as much as you can. What's going on around me? The next step on our color code is yellow. And Jeff Cooper calls this relaxed alert. I am alert. I'm not, I'm not walking around with my head in a bag. I'm paying attention to what's going on around me. I'm not on hyperdrive. I'm not on hair trigger. But I understand that it's a dangerous place to be out in society. And I'm carrying a gun because I know it's a dangerous place. So I need to pay attention to what's going on around me. 360 degrees as much as possible. I practice this when I travel. Over the years I've spent an awful lot of time driving interstates. And so I try to be aware of what's behind me as well as what's around me and in front of me on the interstate. I do that by checking the mirrors. And if I suddenly look up into a mirror and some car has gotten up close to me that I didn't see approaching, well, then I, you know, give myself one demerit for the day because I want to see those cars as far away as possible, even behind me, and be alert to what's going on. If the guy next to me does something stupid and I have to make, an, you know, a, a sudden change of lanes or something to avoid an accident, I need to know where everybody is around me. And, and to me, that's a very good way to practice yellow. As a cop, you need to be paying attention all the time in your vehicle, out of your vehicle, especially when you're making contact with someone especially when you're answering a call. The next level is orange. Yellow was a relaxed alert. Orange is a focused alert. Now I am probably sacrificing that 360 degree security, but I'm focusing in forward. There is something that has piqued my interest. If I'm on a traffic stop, when I start to approach that car, I'm no longer on yellow, I'm on orange. I'm looking forward. You know, you got to pay attention enough as a cop out there. You know, there are more cops hit by cars than, than by bullets every year. So you got to be alert of where you are. That's why nowadays we make passenger side approaches on cars a lot more than driver side approaches on interstate highways. But I'm focused forward. I don't have a threat. I'm not going to have a gun in my hand necessarily. But I'm ready for anything that can happen ahead of me. And my focus is the driver of that car, or perhaps someone else who's in that car. The same thing for civilians. If you're in a restaurant and you hear a commotion, you're going to drop that yellow alert, you're going to move to orange, you're going to look the direction of the commotion and say, what's going on over there? It's not necessarily a threat. I don't have to get prepared to deal with deadly force, but I need to know what's going on over there, and I'm going to concentrate on that until I'm convinced that it's not a problem, that I can go back to my yellow status. In orange, you might identify a threat. Once you identify someone in front of you that is indeed a, po a potential threat, you now shift to red. Red means I'm ready to deal with it. Will you have a gun in your hand in red? Not necessarily because the threat may be focused on someone else rather than me. But if you feel the need to, then I would say have the gun in your hand. In many states, drawing your weapon from the holster is brandishing. And so you are crossing a legal line when you remove that weapon from the holster. You gotta be justified. Having it out of the holster is one thing, pointing it at someone is definitely something else. Now you have crossed a line of assault, or even aggravated assault in many states. You gotta be justifiably taking the right action in those kind of circumstances. So red is not the firing stroke. Red is not pulling the trigger. Red is being in the position where I am ready to if I need to. If I'm, at this point, if I'm going to point a gun at somebody, I have to be in condition red. I have to be ready to make that firing stroke if that's what it's going to take to keep myself and my people safe. A lot of people who teach the color code have added the color black. And I've, I've seen this for two reasons. Some people say black is a totally uncontrolled mind you've gone into panic mode and you're probably not going to survive the situation. They don't understand the color code. The whole point to moving from white to yellow to orange to red is to prevent 
panic, to keep yourself in a state of control, ready to deal with whatever you face. So thinking that we need a black as a panic mode, I think defeats the whole color code. Others have added black and they consider that to be the aftermath of using deadly force. Now that I've gotten to red, the threat presented itself, I had to use deadly force. Now I'm moving into black, which is the aftermath of what is going to befall me from pulling the trigger. I understand their point of view and, and I think programming yourself for what will come when you use deadly force is important, but I don't like the added color. To my notion, I think Cooper came up with a great way to prepare, to, uh, prepare yourself for deadly force. White, yellow, orange, and red. Let's keep it simple, stupid. Okay, we're going to talk about what you have to deal with in the aftermath, but I don't know that we need a color code to, uh, to discuss that. One of the ways to prepare your mind is what if exercises. What would I do if X happens in front of me. We do that with, with uh, young police officers we're training at the academy. You make a traffic stop, someone's driving 15 miles an hour over the limit, okay, that's an offense. We're going to make a stop, we're going to make a contact. There's really no need at this point to think that this is going to be a threatening situation, but you never know. So you have to go to Orange, focus in on this situation until we understand what's going on. And, and we teach them to do what if. What would I do if the door suddenly flies open and this guy rolls out with a pistol in his hand and he's firing at me? Okay. What would I do if I stop at the, uh, the Maverick store and I'm going to go in and get a, a soft drink and when I look through the doors, there's an armed robbery in progress. What would I do? Where would I go? When would I draw? Would I be better to back off? Okay. As a police officer... Backing off may not be available to you because lives are at risk. You kind of got a duty to do something about it. As a citizen, staying out of a gunfight is always job one if you can do it. It's sad to say that other people may die. You have no obligation to protect them. Actually, the courts have said the police have no obligation to protect them. So you certainly don't as a citizen. If you want to put yourself in harm's way and try to protect those people as a citizen, carrying a, a concealed weapon, God bless you, but you're treading a little bit of a minefield if you do it. Certainly, if you get in there, now you are at risk, uh, and you may have the right to defend yourself and the people around you. But you have to ask yourself, should I just back off, be a good observer, call 911, get the cops on the way? Okay, that's a decision that only you can make. As we see more and more people out there on the streets with concealed carry, as more states open this up, we're seeing more cases where these concealed carry individuals take that extra step. Instead of backing away from the gunfight, which is probably the smartest thing to do, we see them putting themselves in harm's way and protecting their fellow citizens. And that's, that's it's a noble thing to do. I think it's just primarily because of the kind of people that Americans are. It's like cops. You know, when cops retire, they're still cops. They, they still view society as something that they have an obligation to protect, even when they're just concealed carry folks themselves. So. We don't know where this country's headed. We know uh, we've seen some horrible things happen in the last few years. In, the, in the 2020, we had riots all over the country. We had um, Antifa, we had BLM. We have a very anti-police climate out there right now. It's becoming much more dangerous rather than less dangerous. We, we hear the media, you know, openly talking about a civil war in this country, that the right and the left are so far apart that they, they can't resolve the problems any other way. Um, I hope that's not true. I'm not sure what the civil war would look like if it ever breaks out. I know it won't be good, but I know who will win. And that's the people like me and you 
if you're watching this, you're concerned about that same thing. You're, you're the kind of person who is taking an active step to protect yourselves. You're not just calling 911 and waiting for the cops to show up because they may not. And if they do, they may not get there in time. You're taking your self-protection and you're, you're putting it in your own hands and you're preparing yourself. And that's what this armed self-defense series was about. That, that's what I wanted to accomplish here. Talking about the book, talking about building a better gunfighter, uh, talking about the cyclic training program we developed as opposed to linear, and the emphasis on mindset as the way most likely to get you through the gunfight. So if you, um, you think I've given you good material, I appreciate your watching to the end. It's always an honor for me to stand in front of people who pay attention and listen to me and think I have something to say that might benefit them. So I thank you for that honor. I appreciate if you could hit the subscribe button, um, ring the little notification bell, give me a thumbs up. I'd like to see where this YouTube channel can go. I think I'm coming at it from a little bit different direction than a lot of the gun-oriented folks. And I'm trying to give you the benefit of, of um, a lot of learning that I've accumulated from a lot of people whose lives were in danger. And unfortunately, some of them didn't live through their encounter, but many of them did. And they would like you to be safer because of what they learned. And I'm just the conduit to pass that to you. So if you've been you think there's something worthwhile in this armed self-defense series that I've done, then look ahead. Um, I mentioned in my uh, introduction that, that one thing that I had done was work with uh, Dr. Marty Fackler, a retired Army surgeon. We developed a way to uh, test pistol bullets in one gallon jugs of water that will give you very accurate results compared to what you could do in calibrated ballistic gelatin. A lot of guys shoot water jugs on YouTube, but just for the novelty of it, I think, but you can actually get a, a very accurate prediction of the depth of penetration, the degree of expansion that you would get in gelatin, which is, is much more expensive, much more difficult to use. So that's going to be one of the next things I do. I've already shot uh, some of the, the video of uh, the, t the bullet testing. It works great for pistols, not so great for rifles, uh, but it, it's worthwhile. And uh, we'll see where this YouTube channel can go, see how much interest you have. If you got something you'd like me to talk about, Put it in the, the comments down below, and we'll see where we go from here. Thank you very much uh, for participating, for going along for the ride. Take care. Okay, we've got them both here now. You ready? Bud got one. Ginger got one. Uh-huh. Oh, she missed it. She usually gets them, doesn't she, bud? Mm -hmm. Okay, girl, last one. Ready? You ready? Yeah! That's all there is till next time. <laughs>